Hello, everybody. I am Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. And today's special guest is Madeline Donano. She is the president and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. So welcome to the show. Well, it's a privilege to be here with you, Wendy, and thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you so much for agreeing. I, I love the work that you guys are doing. And could you explain to every, so everyone understands, what does the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media mean? Essentially, we're changing the world one story at a time, and we're doing it through data-driven advocacy, and we function more behind the scenes in, in Hollywood than most advocacy groups, which are really directing their efforts at you, the public. Yeah. Yeah. And so being behind the scenes, I know that you guys have collected a ton of data and statistics which is hugely important to understand. Unless you measure it, you can't follow through. You can't see where you're going. Um, do you have any of the, the data that you could share with us on, on women, people of color, LGBTQ, disabilities, women, older women in media? <laughs> Absolutely. So the Institute was started in 2004 by two-time Academy Award winning actor Gina Davis as a result of her observations when watching programming with her daughter, who at the time was a toddler. So fast forward based on the discrepancy and not seeing a lot of female characters in these make-believe worlds, she thought, I really want to get the data for this. And in 2004, if you were to ask someone, what's your definition of diversity? Gender was not on the agenda. And that yeah. clearly was something that Gina was thinking about. And she would have conversations with people and she would say, hey, have you seen that movie? There was only that one female character. No one noticed it. And that's where the need for data became really critical. And just to give you a comparison of that was then, this is now, uh, back in 2004, 2005, it took a few years to get the first comprehensive study. It was about a three to one ratio when it came to uh, for every three male characters, there was only... Um, one female character. And when it came to like background characters, secondary characters, it was about a five to one ratio and no one noticed this. And so the mission has not only been about gender, but the intersection of gender and race and age and all the things uh, that you looked at. And so we've always measured the industry. We've done it very collegially. We've never called out or shamed and blame any particular studio or streaming entity, and we've yeah. worked behind the scenes. So bringing us to where we are today, we have seen movement. Uh, in Right before the pandemic, we hit parity, gender parity, in terms of female lead characters yeah. in the highest rated Nielsen programming for families and also the largest grossing a box office for, for family films at the United States. This is U.S. data. But when we look at that intersection of race, LGBTQIA, age, a disability, and body type, we look at that as well. That's where you've seen more glacial you know, movement. Now, in our most recent TV study that we looked at, what are children watching? And what's being made for children? And what we found is that on a positive note, about 70% of that programming uh, was consisted of people of color, but it was because of all this Spanish language programming that children were consuming. And when you think about the Latinx community in the United States, it's a very powerful driving force of community. Um, and especially when it comes to consumption you know, yes. of media, However, uh, when we looked at uh, LGBTQIA, which is about 7% of our, our US population, uh, as noted by the census, it's only about one to 2%. When we look at people with disabilities, which is over a quarter of our population, again, glacial, you know, under 1%. When we look at older adults, you know, 50 plus, which is 36% of our population in the US, it's about two and a half percent. And when it comes to large body types, it's something that we look at because most people are a larger body type, about 40% of our population. And yet 
it's only four to four to five percent. So we do really have a long way to go. We are seeing movement and it's really about you know impact versus intent because you may have good intentions, but then it doesn't manifest itself in how characters are actually being you know portrayed. And there's two things also to consider. You know, people talk about representation, they talk about portrayals, they thought they talk about authenticity. Yes. You yes. want to see authentic portrayals. It's not about just throwing a bunch of female characters or throwing a bunch of Latinx characters, but how are they being portrayed? What are they doing? Are they in a position of leadership? Uh, do they have a job? Uh, is the female character hypersexualized? Uh, so those are the other uh, dimensions that we look at. You know, um, one of the things I love that you brought up, um, you have a tagline, if she can see it, she can do it. And Miss Gina Davis is, I'm a fan. And back when I was in my 20s, she did a couple movies where she was the lead in a pirate movie and a spy movie. And she all, I believe she did all of her own stunts, which were quite remarkable, but she was the lead. She was the heroine. She was the leader of men in these pirate movies. In the spy movie, she took charge of everything. And also something called the Scully effect from, um, I'm blanking on the series, <laughs> X-Files. I was a huge Scully fan. And just seeing women in these roles, it's like, well, I'm watching this. Why can't I do that? And that's so important to put women, people of color, people with disabilities, different body types. We're not one shape or size. We are many different things. And the fact that you guys are promoting this, advocating for this, but measuring it to make sure it happens. Um, the one hard question I have to ask is, you know, when you get pushback from people saying, why do you have to change things? What, what's your what's your best answer just to give people like, why wouldn't we change things? I mean, honestly, we haven't had that pushback. Oh, good. And I think it's because, first of all, we had initially focused on what our youngest children are seeing. But, you know, one of the things we talked about before we started the podcast is doing good is good for business. Yes. And consumers these days will reward those companies, whether it's a brand, whether it's an entertainment entity, um, that are reflecting their stories in an authentic way. They'll, there is more viewership. There will be more tickets sold. I mean, look at what happened with uh, Wakanda Forever. Look at what happened with Wonder Woman. I mean, there's been, you know, uh, crazy rich Asians. I mean, um, you know, people put their money where their mouth is. And, and so there's the social imperative, which is what we've been talking about, but there is a true business imperative as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when people get to see a reflection of themselves on TV or in the movies, they're going to form more empowered and they're going to want to go more frequently and see more of that. I mean, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, 90s, and seeing one stereotype of person over and over and over again kind of has a negative effect on you. You start feeling, you start picking yourself apart and not feeling as good about yourself. So I really love the fact that we're now seeing the shift to all inclusivity and everybody being involved and as, as doing good as doing good business. So I do want to actually focus on that with um, positive influence in theater, in movie and media. Um, how can people get more involved in that? What, what can they do? Well, I think there's the power of the purse, of course. And all of these companies and these brands are paying attention to what you say in your social media and also what you do how are yeah. you spending you know your precious and hard-earned you know dollars and people have a lot of entertainment choices and you're going to make a choice on how many streaming platforms you want to subscribe to and how many movies you want to watch or uh, or shows so um it's it's become very transactional and very measurable in terms of viewership Oh, yeah. And what audiences want to see. And also, you have a voice that will be heard, whether it's TikTok or the newest threads or companies <laughs> are watching. They know what you're saying. Yeah, there are many social platforms now. Um, it gets It's getting to be overwhelming, even for me, just to keep track of everything going on. But um, it's kind of necessary. Um, with respect to the Gina Davis Institute and equality of women and everybody in media, 
can people volunteer for you guys? Can they donate with you guys? Any events that they can participate in? All of the above. Uh, we have a year-round membership, uh, which people can join at an individual level or at a corporate level. And that allows you to attend our events virtually or now back in person, which we're thrilled to have, as well as we have an on-demand library of all of the events and programming that we've done that goes back over 10 years. And a lot of it contains research presentations and uh, very thoughtful panel discussions with high profile celebrities and writers and directors and, and producers. And that's all available you know, exclusively to our membership. The other thing is we just recently launched a CJ Advocates program. And it's for those people who may not be able to uh, lean into a membership, a year-round membership, but it's also a way for them um, to get involved. And you can find all of these things um, on our website um, at www.cjane.org, or you can also reach us through social media, and our handle is at Gina Davis Org. I have a question with the cjane.org. Why, why pick that particular handle? Why was that important? Well, it goes back to the children's book, you know, C. Jane, C. Dick, and it's how Gina started the, um, the Institute many, many years ago before it blossomed into something that went well beyond, you know, just, just gender. Absolutely love that. And, you know, we do need to be seen. Everybody needs to be seen and heard. So I, I do thank you for the work you're doing. I know you're, you're very busy and I appreciate your time today um, to carve out a little piece for me. Um, but please, anytime you want to come back, talk more about your, your developments or promote events, I'm here for you. I love what you are doing. Thank you, Wendy. And again, it was a real privilege to be with you and to all of your listeners. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Um, I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. Madeline De Ono, thank you so much for your time today. I am truly grateful. Take care, guys. Bye.